A very good afternoon and a very warm. 안녕하세요. 환영합니다. 좌석에 앉아 주시기 바랍니다. 제 시간에 시작할 수 있도록 해 주시기 바랍니다. 제 WIWS의 이사이고 제 이름은 바스티안 기거리지 국제전략연구소 방위 및 군수국 분석 국장입니다. 어, 미래의 규모한 기술의 방위 영향의 의장입니다. 말씀드린 것처럼 2017년 군 continues to proliferate more lethal weapons in more hands in more places. Um, but of course, another important dimension of the conversation around technology is uh, is is around emerging technologies and. And in particular, um, the question whether emerging technologies have the potential to be game changers, uh, game changers in changing the balance of power, game changers in terms of military doctrine, game changers uh, as far as the character of conflict and indeed the character uh, or, or the, the, uh, the character of conflict and, and therefore the way people and nations fight uh, is concerned. I think when we speak about emerging technologies, and maybe we might actually spend a bit of time uh, uh, debating what we mean by that, by that term, but of course when we speak of emerging technologies, we will acknowledge a considerable, a considerable agree, uh, a, a degree of, of uncertainty uh, about the promised utility of some of these technologies, about the timelines involved until they might uh, become uh, available, and the cost indeed uh, that that will be incurred in in bringing them, integrating them into into our forces, and all of this, uh, of course, against a background in which uh, defense and and the armed forces um, are actually uh, uh, only uh, 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 one of many centers of innovation uh, these days, um, with many important developments actually taking place in other sectors in the civilian realm and the armed forces and defense establishments being, being increasingly challenged to exploit developments that happen elsewhere and need to develop their capacity to absorb these uh, developments that, that, uh, that happen elsewhere. Those are some of the issues we might want to debate uh, today and, and we've got, I'm, I'm happy to say, an excellent panel uh, to help us uh, uh, do this. Uh, we will uh, go uh, in the order as, as printed uh, in the program, uh, which means that in a minute I will uh, invite uh, Air Chief Marshal Stuart, Sir Stuart Peach, Chief of Defence uh, uh, Staff, United Kingdom, to, to kick us off before uh, handing over to uh, David Koh, our Deputy Secretary for Technology and Special Projects, and also the Defence Cyber Chief, the Ministry of Defence uh, here in, in Singapore, uh, followed by Congressman Mac uh, Thornberry, Chairman of the Committee on Armed Forces, U.S. House of Representatives, and last but not least, uh, Colonel Zhu uh, 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 Ji Chao, Professor at the National University of Defense Technology, People's Liberation Army uh, of, of China. Before I uh, uh, do that, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, the special session is on the record. Um, we will have a Q&A session after uh, initial uh, statements. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to your remarks and your interventions uh, from the floor. We want to have a lively debate. And with that out of the way, uh, uh, Air Chief Marshal, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Chair. And Congressmen, Generals, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity, and in particular thanks to the Government of Singapore for hosting this event. Of course, Singapore is declared on a smart nation agenda, which means they've already understood the needs of technology as set out by the chairman. And I note that we sit in a region where I think I'm right that the Republic of Korea and Japan represent the two nations of the world that have already embraced robotics in a way that many other nations are yet to do. So we sit in a region where technology is understood and indeed where much of the technology that's in daily use has evolved very rapidly. So my first point as a Chief of Defence Staff, which is uh, simply put, but we could debate it at some length, which is that technology is now evolving far faster than the military procurement process. And that is an important point because that means we need to change our process or we're going to fall behind in 
the use of technology as applied to conflict. And of course, if we need to or wish to deploy military power in, in a regional or, or wider sense, then we need to understand how to embrace technology to enable that. And quite often we can embrace technology by programs and platforms that will last in service for many years. Uh, ships are an obvious example, but aeroplanes too. Uh, many of the aeroplanes will probably last for many decades, and therefore we need to build in to platforms the ability to evolve over time. And one of the things that is very clear in the world is the challenge function is now no longer just being sunk in a ship or shot down in an aeroplane, or the telephone interrupting uh, the <laughs> debate. One of the real challenges now is that everyday technology can be turned to malevolent use. I come from the UK, far away from your region, where we're just recovering from another terrorist attack, which was a homemade bomb. And of course, the technology we're talking about here is not just at the top end, it's also everyday technology, which can be turned to malevolent use. And I would suggest that there's no nation in the room that is immune from this in the sense of terrorism. Therefore, there is a need to think about the evolution of everyday objects into things that which will do us harm, which I would argue calls for greater attention by military leaders and by some of the political leadership to an old-fashioned word called resilience, mm. the ability to cope with a setback and then bounce back. And I think that is important, both in terms of systems and platforms, but also in terms of the people who are in our military. And I, I will close on that thought because I think the people in our military are also part of the potential solution. There'll be much talk on this panel and around the, the people in this room who have many more qualifications than me about what novel effects might be out there, how they may be employed and in may be offered by industry to the military. But I would argue, after 40 odd years military experience, please not at an increasing cost. <laughs> because that way we end up with far fewer of everything and all the things that we identify as trends just get more difficult for us to counter. So I think there is something really serious there. I recall very clearly the international operation that's ongoing in Afghanistan, where probably that was the acme of the time when nobody really cared about fuel consumption. It seems like an odd thing to talk about to such a conference at this time. But nobody cared about fuel consumption, so one of the biggest problems in the whole campaign was getting the amount of fuel we needed into the point of need. And so I do think we have to take note of the need for renewable energy, not just to apply to our houses and our way of life, but also to future military capabilities. And this balance between the high cost of procurement and the high cost of equipment uh, and the low cost of being able to turn everyday objects or indeed older weapons to use was brought home to us in many campaigns and, I, and they are obvious points but I'll just make one from recent operations where highly sophisticated expensive missiles are being used to defeat snipers. Well the cost equation balance is way out of kilter there as it is in many other uh, sub-state conflicts. So if the first thought is that the the military procurement is struggling to keep up with all this change. The second thought is, which I'm sure my comments will be picked up on in debate, which is the information environment is changing far quicker than the legal and permission environment, particularly in coalition operations. And therefore, the need to understand how to verify and assure information in conflict or in ambiguous uh, moments has always been important, actually, but is now more important than ever. And the third point and final point, knowing that time is tight, I wanted to leave you with, is a really serious point about the skills necessary and the processes by which human skills are employed in the militaries has to change. All of the demographies represented by the countries and interests in this room, each demography will be different. Some will have more young people than others. 
some will have more young people willing to join the military than others. But I think it's true to say that our processes and our, the way in which we manage our people is still very much structured as the way it was many years ago, indeed arguably many decades ago. And I think that has to change. And then in the interest of the Institute, which I've been working with for many years, I'll just leave you with a provocative thought, which is that people like me, the Chiefs of Defence Staff, and the generals around the table must be involved in the scientific research process. You can't just delegate it to scientists you don't find the time to talk to. That way, you will not get the science you need to cope with the world we're in. You have to take part. Thank you. Yeah, Chief Marshall, thank you, thank you very much for, for those uh, uh, remarks. I think there are many points that, that people will want to pick up. Uh, I'll thank you in particular for that last uh, call for a, a close link and direct involvement of the, of the practitioners in, in the research effort. Uh, I think uh, people will have thoughts on, on acquisition uh, uh, and the challenge that you've pointed out there and, and also the management uh, of people. Um, all very important issues that I'm sure we will want to come back with, uh, we'll come back to. Uh, but now I'll, I'll ask uh, David Ko to add his perspective to, to this theme. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Deputy Secretary for Technology in the Ministry of Defence. So I'm responsible for acquisition, technology and logistics. Concurrently, I'm also the Defence Cyber Chief, and I oversee cyber policy, operations and capability development in the Ministry of Defence and the Singapore Armed Forces. And whatever spare time that I have left, I'm also the Chief Executive of the Cyber Security Agency in the Prime Minister's office, overseeing cyber security for the entire nation. Just to make the point, Singapore is a very small nation, a shrimp among nations, and we certainly don't have enough people. So I work on emerging technologies all the time, whether it's related to defense or cybersecurity, and increasingly that I find my different portfolios overlap, and sometimes they clash. Um, the interests of the different uh, organizations which I lead are not always in synchronization. Fortunately, I am on good speaking terms with myself, so I can resolve most of these differences amicably. <laughs> Jokes aside, the challenges that I face in managing the implications of emerging technologies are challenges that all countries represented around the room will have to deal with. In the civilian world, it's clear that the fourth industrial revolution, as first described by Klaus Schwab, is upon us. Previous industrial revolutions, led by technological inventions such as the steam engine, mechanization, and computers, all took decades or even centuries to develop and fully realize. But the fourth industrial revolution is unique in its speed and scale, in that a whole range of emerging technologies, cyber, artificial intelligence, data analytics, robotics, they're all being developed, iterated, and improved on, all in the space of a few years. The resultant impact and disruption will be enormous. Singapore has launched our Smart Nation vision to harness these technologies to transform our homes, businesses, transportation, networks, healthcare, public service sectors, how we live, how we work, how we play, and how we deliver services. The emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution will also have an impact on the military. Just as the third industrial revolution of computers in the 80s and 90s led to a revolution in military affairs with concepts such as network-centric warfare and precision strike, I believe that the fourth industrial revolution, that we are on the cusp of another revolution in military affairs, one that will leverage on cyber, AI, big data, and robotics. While the full implications of this revolution are still unclear, we're beginning to see how we can apply these new technologies in defense. A significant area of application is the use of artificial intelligence and data analytics in counterterrorism. One of the biggest problems in dealing with a terrorist threat is that it's often like searching for a needle in a haystack. In Singapore, we are developing systems to use AI to do exactly this. One example is the Singapore Maritime Crisis Center, which monitors more than 1,500 commercial shipping vessels in our waters on a daily basis. It uses AI to generate unique signatures for each vessel by collating information from multiple sources, including open source in information, commercial data, intelligence sources, and even social media. The AI then detects any deviations from this base signature. The AI embedded method detected a possible ISIS supporter on board a oil tanker in 2015. Singapore authorities were alerted and the person on, was barred from disembarking into Singapore. 
Another example was of how the fourth industrial revolution can transform the military is in the area of logistics, as the Air Chief Marshal spoke about. Much has been said about how companies such as Amazon use AI, data analytics and robotics to streamline processes in their warehouses, which translates into economic advantage. But these technologies can also be implied in the military. After all, if you look at processes uh, in an air base or a naval base, or even in a forward deployed base, many are related to logistics, regardless of whether you're managing books and boxes or bullets and bombs. AI and data analytics will help you to manage your inventory more efficiently and effectively. This is why the Singapore Armed Forces is investing in a smart air base out in Changi and a smart naval base, which will be developing in Tuas. These two examples are just the tip of the iceberg of how emerging technologies can transform the military. However, technology alone is necessary but insufficient to bring about the emerging military revolution. To fully unleash the potential of these technologies, we must transform the way we think, how we operate, train, structure our forces and develop capability, capabilities to integrate these individual technologies into a system of systems for war fighting. Two historical examples, one civilian, the other military. Let me illustrate the point. First, the iPhone. This was launched 10 years ago in 2007. It was revolutionary. It was revolutionary, but it wasn't because it did not use any fundamentally new technology because it integrated existing technologies such as touch screens, flash storage drives, 3G mobile technology into a new way to create a revolutionary product. Similarly, in the military realm, tanks, dive bombers, artillery and the radio were not new technologies at the time of World War II, but the German army was first to integrate them together to great effect. In the same way, militaries all around the world must be able to innovate and experiment with these emerging technologies in order to find the best way to integrate them. We need to nurture a culture where it is safe to experiment, safe to fail. In Singapore, we're expanding our use of agile development cycles and changing our procurement processes. Failing fast and cheap is okay, as long as we learn rapidly. Failing is not the point. The point is to learn from that failure and to move on and eventually succeed. However, just as the fourth industrial revolution ex has exposed increasing segments of the civilian population to the threat of cyber attacks, these new technologies, if not secured by a robust and resilient cyber defense, can also become the Achilles heel for the military. Certainly, no military can afford to fall prey to ransomware or have their capabilities and platforms disabled over the net. This is why the Ministry of Defence in Singapore has established the Cyber Defence Cyber Organisation, which is tasked to lead and orchestrate the cyber defence of the entire defence ecosystem, including our defence industries and other MINDEF-related organisations, to ensure that there are no weak spots in our network to be exploited. To boost our numbers of cyber defenders, we will be selecting, training and deploying both regular professional soldiers as well as our national servicemen. These are our conscripts who serve two years of compulsory military service. These will be selected based on aptitude into the cybersecurity roles, maximizing our pool of cyber talent for Singapore, not just in the military and the government, but also the wider ecosystem. Apart from defending our military networks, the Defence Cyber Organization will also contribute to national cybersecurity. One feature of the digital domain is that conventional labels such as homeland security or external defence uh, may no longer apply. After all, the internet and cyberspace is borderless and attacks can originate from anywhere, from the point of origin, often mass. Furthermore, attacks against civilian critical infrastructure such as power grids and transportation networks will have implications both on civilian as well as the military. This is perhaps the reason why the powers that be decided that I should head both the Civilian Cybersecurity Agency as well as the Defence Cyber Organisation. In recognition of our cross-cutting efforts of cyber attacks, we will be deploying our cyber defenders from the Ministry, Ministry of Defence to support the Cybersecurity Agency in defending civilian critical information infrastructure as well. I've discussed this with myself and I've reached a consensus. <laughs> In conclusion, the emerging technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution offer great opportunities for countries to enhance their defences against critical threats such as terrorism. However, to fully realise the potential of these technologies, militaries must change how they think, how they operate, train, force structure and develop capabilities. Even as we do so, we must be cognizant of the new vulnerabilities that are created 
by reliance on these technologies. Thus, we must create new structures to defend ourselves against these new emerging threats that can exploit those vulnerabilities. If we can do both, then we will be able to bring the emerging military revolution and harness these new technologies to better provide for the security of our people. Thank you. Deputy Secretary, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, and, and I congratulate you on your efficient decision-making process. Uh, I think you did very well in balancing your, your various roles. Uh, I think the potential for disruption is, is an interesting interesting point. Um, uh, also, the, the, the idea of that the, the real disruption will come from integrating several technologies. It's not one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think uh, we might also want to talk a little bit about uh, what failing fast and cheap uh, means for the culture of defense establishments and, and the armed forces. I think there's a significant challenge there. Uh, Congressman, um, the U.S. obviously uh, in, uh, in a process of implementing the third offset, uh, uh, in a process of developing links uh, between uh, the military uh, and, and different parts of the, of the private sector, um, civilian uh, applications, uh, bringing, bringing processes and, and, and ideas into, into the military realm uh, that originate elsewhere. I imagine uh, there's quite a lively debate uh, in, your, uh, 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 in, your, in your committee and, and around uh, the House of Representatives. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think uh, some of the observations I want to make are very similar to what we have already heard. And I hope that uh, it will be reinforcing rather than merely repetitive. Uh, I, I should say at the beginning that I come at this topic uh, as a legislator in the United States government system. We sometimes even have to remind our colleagues in Congress, much less some of our colleagues in other branches of government, that Congress serves as a separate, independent, equal branch of government, and the Constitution puts responsibility on our shoulders to build and support, provide and maintain, make the rules and regulations for the military forces of the United States. So it is a fair amount of our responsibility to cope with the incredible change in technologies of various kinds that, that we have already heard discussed. My thought is some of them have obvious military implications, others are gonna be surprises. And, and as the Air Chief Marshal said, some will be for good and some will be not for good, uh, which, which will challenge our, our system. What, what is inevitable, however, is that we have a lot of change occurring all at the same time, and that pace of change will accelerate. Uh, seems to me we can all uh, agree on that. So what are the implications when it comes to defense and especially our responsibilities uh, to build and support, provide and maintain? Well, I think uh, it is certainly true that, m at least in the United States and I think elsewhere, more and more of the innovation occurs in the private sector, not in government. And that means that defense and intelligence communities have to be better customers and uh, have a better working relation, better partners with private industry. If we make it too difficult, too bureaucratic, too rigid to deal with government, more and more companies will simply say, I don't need that. I will just deal with the commercial market and avoid the hassle. And we will not be able to utilize these innovations, at least in the, in the early stages. As, as, as was previously mentioned, another implication is that if technology is changing that quickly and we don't have the processes to adapt at that rate, we will inevitably be fielding technology that is out of date at the time it is fielded. So back to the pace of technological change, we have to adjust our processes and organizations to reflect that pace of change. And, and the other related but, but maybe similar point is we also have to change our decision making to reflect change of, on that pace. Uh, we have to be able to recognize a new technology or for good or ill and adjust quickly. 
uh, we don't have the luxury of, of studying for years. And, and so it's not just the acquisition process that has to be adjusted, it is the whole decision-making process that must uh, operate at, at the pace of change. So for the last two years, uh, acquisition reform has been a key priority for uh, those of us in Congress. We've made some progress. We're going to try to make more progress this year. And at the same time, we have to remember that as we're trying to improve our process, we still have to get fuel into the plane that is in flight tonight. And the raffle has to get in the hands of the guy in Afghanistan today. So the current acquisition system has to meet the demands on it while we are reforming at the same time. Just a couple other observations uh, on, on this pace of change. I agree completely with the statement of the Air Chief Marshal that technology is changing much faster than the policies uh, on how to use them. And that includes the ethics of uh, using those policies. For example, the law of armed conflict basically holds individuals responsible for the decisions they make. If it's a robot that kills somebody mistakenly, who do you hold responsible for it? We have enormous challenges in trying to uh, have cyber policies keep up with the pace of change of the cyber threat and cyber capabilities. And so I think it is absolutely a challenge for policymakers to have policies, the ethics of policies that, that keep up with the degree and the magnitude of technological change that we've been talking about. I also agree with the point that this sort of innovation will ch change the way the military operates and some of that change will be culturally challenging. Um, there, uh, I hesitate to say this with an Air Force officer, but uh, there was some resistance in the United States to airplanes without pilots because it was so countercultural. And, and some of the change was delayed because it's not the way we have traditionally operated. It's not the way we have traditionally operated to have boats without captains. And, and so it, just simple examples of the cultural change that these technological changes will, will bring about, which also leads to a, a similar point made a few moments ago the intellectual development and ethical education of all members of the military will be more important as decision making becomes more widely distributed and as decisions are made at a lower level in, in the chain of command. Finally, similar uh, to our Singapore and colleague point, I think with this magnitude of change in so many areas, we have to think about every domain of life being challenged. And so the, the point of what's law enforcement, what's military, what's civilian, what's, what's not, uh, is, is going to be contested. We've seen recently uh, voting systems in a variety of countries that have been challenged. We saw healthcare systems in countries that were delayed or shut down uh, and, and those were cyber connected, but it could have easily been some uh, sort of activity related to space or, or other things. Uh, all of this change in so many areas will, will test us. I guess the, the concluding thought is, uh, this panel is devoted to a tremendous amount of change in technology and in how we utilize technology, and yet it seems to me the dominant theme of this conference has been how we maintain the rules-based international order. And, and, and so those principles do not change. The, the technologies, the methods, the processes, the decision-making must keep up with a pace of change, but there are some fundamental principles which have benefited us all, that we need to make sure uh, are continued even though the methods uh, are different than they've been in the past. Congressman, thank you very much. I think it's very, uh, 
it's, it's extremely valuable to have your perspective on, on some of these challenges uh, r representing the, the branch of government that you do uh, and, and on acquisition reform. I think that the way you spoke about the, the challenge of, of operating and innovating at the same time uh, in a way I think is, is uh, something that will, that will resonate with a lot of people and, and also uh, I think something that you're very well qualified to talk about is, of course, also the that regulatory and legislative gap that, that might emerge, something that I, I imagine uh, 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 the legislative branch must, must, must spend quite a bit of time thinking about. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Colonel Zhu to, to add his perspective uh, to this panel. Colonel, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and the honor to give a discussion. And I want to follow uh, David and uh, Congressman Thumbry, uh, the title. I'd like to uh, give my understanding about uh, AI and uh, its implication in defense. Last week, uh, AlphaGo, an artificial intelligence Go program developed by DeepMind team uh, of Google, defeated the Chinese as well as the world number one uh, top player, Ke Jie, again, and which marked the new order, uh, new record. With the development of uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning, big data, cloud computing, and Internet of Things, AI is resting at the center of the coming technological, industrial, and military revolution. Broadly speaking, AI is such technology related with computer science that emphasize the creation of intelligent machines that may think, work, and react like humans, such as learning and problem solving. During World War II, British code breakers developed uh, Colossus, uh, which is the, regarded uh, as the world's uh, first uh, programmable computer. Since then, AI has been widely used in better fields. Intelligent sensors and the wearable equipment may help improving information collection and uh, sharing. Cloud computing and big data analysis can be used in cyber attack detection and attribution. More than 70 countries have the ability to develop unmined uh, vehicles, drones, and ships and the robot warriors will be in service, maybe, uh, in the near future. There is no doubt that AI will reshape defense capability and turn scientific fic uh, fiction plots uh, into reality. However, new challenges for defense and security should not be underestimated. First of all, AI will make war more precise, um, more uh, crueler and uh, the strike action uh, quicker. The mind system will be uh, used by sophisticated states to reduce their military characters. But the civilian collateral characters may not be guaranteed when the terrorism, when the terrorist hiding among them. Secondly, AI will never replace human ingenu uh, ingenuity. AI is simply an automated way of building algorithmic patterns to utilize large amount of data. It has shown its own limitation uh, in challengeable conditions, conditions. Like any other automated tools, AI can do harm to a human being when used in the wrong ways. AI is far from perfect. There may be a certain amount of errors in AI system because of human errors and me uh, mechanical defects. In a confrontational environment, AI system could be invaded or damaged by malware and virus. Thus, uncontrollable AI system may murder the innocent. Last but not least, because of coexistence of man in the loop and man out of the loop, it is difficult to hunt down the, those responsible for the uh, fo uh, faulty missions. For example, those responsible for a humanitarian disaster caused by drones uh, may 
involve the pilot, the computer programmer, the procurement officer, and the commander, and so on. Therefore, it is more difficult to find th those responsible for AI mistake than human mistake. Meanwhile, owing to the spread of low-cost, low-threshold ICT technologies, terrorists could ex uh, exploit AI and its weakness to launch an attack. In an increasingly interconnected and globalized world, we are facing more and more risks of cross-domain attacks and the risks of uh, miscalculation, misjudgment, and misperception. For instance, a cyber attack by using AI technology and damage, uh, can damage critical infrastructure and industrial control systems. If a nuclear weapons control system is hacked by AI, it may cause uh, even great disaster. The booming of AI technology is the extraordinary trend of our time. AI may lead to open source warfare, algorithmic warfare, hybrid warfare, and so on. For one, uh, it will be more and more difficult to pursue absolute security for one country alone. It is no other way but cooperation between sovereign states to encounter the challenges. Big powers and the technological advanced countries should take on more responsibilities to discuss and assess the common challenges in the media and the long run for our shared community. The technological advanced countries should contribute more with AI technology to fight against the terrorism, transnational crime, disaster early warning, and humanitarian assistance missions. And, uh, and the international community should cast more concern on retroactive liability for AI weapon abuse, trying to reach the consensus on international law enforcement. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Colonel, thank you very much for, for uh, putting those thoughts on the table around, around uh, AI. Uh, I think, um, and, 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 and raising issues around machine learning, deep learning, um, certainly something where, where uh, that potential is recognized, but also, but also the experience shows that uh, there are still uh, quite a number of problems there, um, uh, and, and, and it's one of those areas where I don't think we quite know yet uh, uh, what the potential ultimately uh, uh, will be. Uh, so I think that there, there's a rich menu of, of themes on the table, um, uh, and I'll, I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite you to, to uh, make your comments and, and ask questions. The easiest uh, way to do that is, is to uh, uh, catch my eye by, by putting your, your name board uh, uh, up. Uh, I've got uh, Francois Isbourg, who, uh, who doesn't have a name board, but who I, I, I recognize uh, nevertheless. Francois, please. Thank you very much, Bastian, uh, and thank you uh, for uh, the various uh, presentations. Uh, uh, just a remark and a question. Uh, the remark is about uh, artificial intelligence, which is indeed uh, going to be a pivotal uh, uh, concern for the reasons which have already been addressed, but precisely because it will not be easily possible uh, to blame an imprudent or ill-disciplined soldier or to uh, blame a technical fault. The responsibility for something going, on, going wrong on AI will fall squarely on the, the state or non-state organization which is in charge. There will be a, a direct political responsibility thrust uh, on the top agency. And that will have implications uh, in terms of international and strategic relations. The question is about, how, is, uh, is about another, technologic, another technology. Not all of the emerging technologies happen to be electronically driven. Uh, uh, I've been tracking uh, some of the work which is being done in the field of hypervelocity in the US, in Russia, in China. Uh, to a more limited extent in my own country, France. A high velocity, hyper velocity, high precision conventional weapons are a potential game changer, at least in my view. But I'd be very interested in hearing the views of the panelists. Thank you. 
So I thank you very much uh, for the comment and, and the question. I'll invite two more interventions before, four, three more interventions, sorry, uh, before uh, turning uh, back to the panel. Uh, next on my list is uh, Mr. Carty, please. There's been a lot of talk about uh, liabilities, obligations, responsibilities, uh, and Congressman Thornberry, you mentioned something about a rules-based order. My question is twofold. The first is, who should lead the development of a rules-based order. You have ICANN, a civilian organization. You have UNCLOS, which is for the sea, but an equivalent parallel. Uh, and what would that look like? How do you handle uh, instances in which uh, attacks are made by one country on another, in which attribution is quite different? When you have two ships that come against each other, you can tell one has one flag, the other has another flag. When you have a cyber attack, it's not quite clear if it's a country, if it's a kid in a basement, or if it's uh, a non-state actor. So how does attribution and responsibility and liability work in a rules-based order world for cyber? Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Oksha, please. Um, you often hear generals saying that mass matters. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent do the panel think that emerging technologies mean we may not need so many people in our armed forces in future? And just a brief one for the Air Chief Marshal. Uh, I'm wondering whether he thinks that the UK should be putting more resources into developing new technologies. The US has DARPA. Uh, I'm not aware that we have anything that's quite equivalent of that. Thank you very much. And the uh, last one in this round, but we'll, we'll have a second round. But uh, for this round, uh, Ruslan Pukov, please. Uh, it's not a question. It's uh, a comment and, and an idea for discussion. But I will start with reassuring congressmen. Our militaries are even more rigid with uh, unmanned RL vehicles, there was a huge debate whether it's an aircraft or it's a missile, and uh, both services like an orphan, you know, like militaries are rigid by definition, don't worry. And uh, your one is much more flexible than, than former Soviets. But uh, my question and my comment is about uh, cultural issue. Uh, Recently, I, I was reading a book where it was written that in 1975, South Korea got a donation from Shah of Iran because it was poor country, you know, and where is Iran and where is South Korea? Yeah, it was in 1975. Tremendous leap in technology. Uh, there is another example, Sweden, a oh, su uh, superpower in miniature, gripping uh, Corvette, stealth technology, small country, relatively small GDP. From another point of view, there are really very rich countries, but they produce no innovation. That's why uh, we can say that it's probably about democracy, not democracy. Okay, Russia is not perfect liberal democracy, but there is a military innovation to compare, let's say, Saudi Arabia or some other Gulf states. Uh, my question to anyone in the panel, uh, should we take the soul of nation cultural uh, issue into the account. Uh, I, I would probably sound racist, but, but, but since I'm Russian, probably I can afford myself such a luxury. Ah. I will never forget uh, that uh, the founding father of uh, this uh, state, Lee Kuan Yew, all this said that basically I'm like a banana, I'm white inside, I only appear yellow, that he was learning Chinese as a foreign language because his uh, grandfather already went to British school, so he was thinking in, in, in English. Uh, some uh, Nobel laureates from Asia was, as a joke, saying that we're thinking, thinking about physics, we're thinking not in our native language, but, but in English. So I, I tried to touch upon this subject because English, first of all, is not my native language, and plus I'm really afraid to be taken as a racist, that, that, but you know what I mean. If you know, please give comment. Thank you very much. I, I'll now uh, turn, turn back to, to the panel and, and, and starting with the Air Chief Marshal. So I mean, there, there, there's the uh, uh, issue around uh, artificial intelligence uh, raised by Francois uh, and, and the particular question of the, the game-changing nature of, of hypervelocity, high precision. Um, uh, there's a question directed directly at you, um, and, and, and there's, of course, uh, also the, the, the question of culture of innovation, if there is such a thing, um, uh, whether it has to do with uh, a particular uh, uh, mindset or, indeed, uh, experience 
that, that promotes it more than others, uh, uh, I personally don't know, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Air Chief Commander, please. Thank you. Certainly there is promise in high velocity, hyper velocity, but none of the problems that I tried to highlight go away. In fact, in many ways, it makes it worse. If you have an even higher velocity uh, projectile, you have to have an even faster decision-making process. <laughs> And you still have to operate within a, a framework of legitimate uh, authority, or we do. So I think the, the challenge faced with such weapons and such moments is actually the command and control challenge. As for the question about the UK and DARPA, it's not a new question, I'm pleased to say. But I'm pleased to say in reply that we have an, an innovation strategy which followed the previous strategic defense review in the UK. And we have uh, a number of strands to that, looking at many of these technologies through the defense science labs and many other um, UK elements. And one, uh, one of the things I'm particularly happy to see is at long last, actually, in my view, uh, an approach which actually encourages small and medium enterprises to become involved in defense research and innovation. And I think that's a really important point because Large organizations, even large laboratories, and even large academic, academic institutions are not always going to be the best innovators, which goes back to the, the minefield opened up by the last question. And I'd simply say, linguists tend to be very clever people, and people who speak many languages tend to be even more clever than normal. And I think the history of science shows that many of the great innovators in all walks of life, including politics, are often multilingual. And so maybe the answer to your question is a plea for people to learn more languages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Secretary, please. Right. I, let me just cover one of uh, one or two of the questions. I think there was a question on the rules-based order. I think this is um, there's ongoing debate on where best this can be done. I'd just like to highlight the work of the UNGGE, the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts. Uh, it's a mouthful um, for ICT in the realm of uh, um, uh, national security. Um, they have, in the 2015 uh, round, uh, come up with a consensus of 11 norms of behavior which govern uh, um, the use of cyberspace. Uh, admittedly, they are not uh, comprehensive and arguably they are not uh, detailed in, uh, in their definitions and implementations, but I think this forms the basis of uh, some of the discussion which we can potentially have uh, going forward. But primarily, these govern the, the rules. Uh, these are at a very broad level, um, having um, addressing the question of where, whether international law uh, is relevant in uh, in cyberspace. Answer is yes. Uh, whether um, uh, and states agreeing not to uh, attack each other's uh, critical infrastructure or to attack uh, each other's uh, computer emergency response teams. But uh, truth be told, the the norms govern uh, state to state. Uh, uh, behavior and less so on, uh, uh, and, and but they lean towards cooperation uh, among states uh, for non-state actors. I think that that's uh, the general uh, thrust of it. Uh, there was a question on whether mass matters and whether we think um, going forward technologies will help to reduce the size of the armed forces. Um, let me speak from the Singapore Armed Forces perspective. We are we have a conscript uh, system. Uh, the challenge that uh, Singapore faces is that we have not enough babies. Uh, despite our best efforts of our politicians and throwing uh, lots of incentives at our young couples, they just refuse to, for whatever reason, procreate. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and because we are a conscript armed force, the challenge is uh, it's actually uh, um, quite uh, evident for us. Uh, the, the people who will serve in our armed forces are in school today, and we see the numbers uh, declining at a very steady state. Uh, our estimates, our projections are by the year 2030, um, our uh, size of uh, the armed forces will drop by 30%, 30. That's a disruption in any sense of the word. So we do expect, or we hope, and we are working towards technology making the difference. Otherwise, the uh, armed forces capability of the Republic of Singapore will change dramatically. So we are looking at ways and means where both at the, um, at the logistics uh, supply chain side, as well as even in the leading edge, uh, how technology can help to augment uh, our numbers. It's not driven by innovation or, or a desire, but really by necessity. 
and hopefully necessity will be the mother of invention. Uh, if I speak a little bit about the culture, whether it makes a difference, I believe it does. Uh, I think that uh, speaking from an Asian perspective, uh, Asians, uh, firstly, uh, respectful of age. So one of the benefits of having grey hair is that people take you more seriously, regardless of uh, whether uh, um, you have any wisdom. Uh, and uh, secondly, I think uh, we are also tend to be a hierarchical. Uh, so if, you are, if you're an air chief marshal, generally speaking, um, you, you get taken seriously again, whether, uh, of course, present company accepted. <laughs> A uh, friend of mine, uh, when he uh, got promoted to become chief of army, uh, he told me, David, I'm surprised it can't be that I've suddenly become cleverer overnight. So I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said that, you know, in the past when I came up with an idea, all of you, people like you would say that, that's wrong, you're stupid, you don't understand the background. Now when I speak in my forums, people say, sir, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so I think culture does play a difference. Thank you. Thank you for these brilliant remarks. Uh, um, Mr. Congressman, uh, you, you brought up the issue of, of uh, rule of rule of law and international order. Um, uh, I mean, please feel free to respond to the other questions as well, but I wonder whether you have thoughts on that attribution challenge uh, for that. Well, there's no question that attribution is a challenge in cyber. We grapple with that. Uh, and even if we can see, for example, that uh, a, a cyber attack comes from a particular country, was it sanctioned by the state? You know, that's been in the news here in, in, in the past few days. But, but it's not just cyber. Um, there could well be a bioterrorist event and trying to trace back. Uh, particularly if it's cleverly designed, is it naturally occurring? Is it, uh, was it intentionally induced? If so, by whom? Now, you know, some of these uh, emerging technologies and analytics give us clues for, to trace back uh, where certain things came, but, there, but there's no question that uh, whether we're talking about what nation or, or non-nation state is responsible for attack or back to the, the first part of the first question, what individual or organization to hold accountable for a particular decision. We're, all of these changes we're talking about are, are, are challenged by those uh, changes in, in technology. The only other point I'd like to make briefly, do we need as many people? I think it is certainly true we may be able to operate a ship without as many people as we have in, in the past. Uh, but I also think it is true that we will have to make a greater investment in each of those people. Uh, the need for uh, education and technical sophistication and, and, and all of that uh, is challenging, especially in, when we're talking about these emerging technologies where many of them can go make tremendously more money outside. And, and so the government has to uh, invest a lot to get someone up to speed. And then part of the challenge we'll face is how do you keep them uh, when you've invested so much and they have so much ability, and yet we have, we have to go down that road. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's a very important point, the, the, competi the, the competition for talent. And, and what do you do to attract people? Is it, is it, is it uh, around uh, uh, giving them skills? Is it about some other form of recognition or, or whatever it is? Uh, uh, I think, uh, again, countries will have different ways, I think, of conceiving of, 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 of that challenge, depending on also cultural aspects of, of where the military fits in in, in, in society. Uh, Colonel, um, I wondered, I mean, please, again, feel, feel free to engage with any of the issues that, that were raised, but uh, I wondered whether you had thoughts on the uh, AI uh, question and, and the perhaps shifting um, uh, 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 responsibility and, and locus of, 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 that, of that responsibility, please. I, I'm not a commander, not a government uh, offi offi of officer. I'm a researcher. I'm a researcher with the Center, Center for National Security and Strategic Studies. So uh, my colleagues and I, uh, I are very interested in uh, AI, and ICT, and uh, which can be used in cyber uh, security area. So it is very important uh, to study or think how to um, how to make the responsibility, uh, the liability, 
And it is difficult if we use more and more AI, especially AI can be used by uh, one sovereign country, sovereign state, and uh, uh, most, most state uh, alliance and work together, and non-state actors. So it is very interesting how to uh, make, uh, how to uh, find uh, anal analytic framework to address uh, such challenges, uh, such uh, questions, I think. And as we talk about uh, the, uh, the leading technology or edge technology, especially such technology can change the games. And uh, one gentleman talk about the, perhaps the high, hyper speed uh, weapon technology. I think it is, uh, such technology can cause uh, more and more concern about uh, the misjudgment. And if we use such weapon, uh, even, uh, even in the conventional purpose, and will cause a mis mis misjudgment or miscalculation, perhaps they will, it will look like the nuclear weapons. So it is very important uh, how to uh, improve such uh, a confidence building mechanism when uh, one country use such uh, high hyperspeed uh, weapon. And uh, it is still, uh, I think, a tough question and the scholars often talk about when we uh, talk about uh, the nuclear security and the strategic stability in such areas. And the gentleman from Russia talked about the cultural element. I think it is, it is very interesting, especially in Asia. In Asia's uh, community, like uh, David uh, talked about. And I think when we talk about the technology, the implication uh, for security, uh, for a society, stability, and harmony, it, we should not overlook uh, the culture element. Because different culture has the different understanding about uh, uh, the use, the utilization about technology. Perhaps the technology is the same, but the understanding is different. So I think the, such a dialogue is very important for and for us, with a different language, different cultural background, uh, we discuss uh, such uh, uh, tough questions. It's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've, I've now have, I have eight people on my list. Um, uh, I will take them in two groups of four. So I'll, I'll ask uh, everybody for uh, uh, brief uh, questions and, and comments so that we can get through um, uh, all these uh, interventions uh, and, and responses to them in the next 30 minutes, which is what we have left. So, uh, uh, Mr. Lloyd Paris, uh, first, please. Thank you. Um, these are fascinating subjects, but for those of us who are not specialists in, in this field, these discussions sometimes take on a rather abstract quality. So, I was wondering if, I hope it wouldn't be too pedestrian, if I ask for a bit more concrete detail about one particular case that was mentioned, the intriguing case that was mentioned by Mr. Cole of the IS supporter or suspected supporter who was identified on the oil tanker and barred from entry in Singapore in 2015. Without giving any secrets away, can you tell us a bit more about how that happened in concrete terms. Uh, you know, what were the steps that led up to the, the AI identification of this person? What sort of data inputs you had? Help us to understand how that sort of thing works in practice. Thank you very much. Uh, Nigel Ingster. Uh, thank you, Bastian. I'd like to return to the subject of artificial intelligence, which had a first kind of flowering in the 1990s uh, uh, and which fizzled probably due largely to uh, insufficient computing power and insufficient data. But we now seem to be you know, really moving fast. Um, opinions vary on whether and when the so-called singularity, uh, the point at which machines get smarter than people, will happen. There are as many views as there are um, experts on that. Uh, but AI is developing rapidly. 
And in a world that we've just been talking about, where a lot of, you know, in, in the military context, where a lot of stuff happens a lot faster, a lot more information's coming in, um, it's clear that militaries are going to have to rely increasingly on artificial intelligence systems for um, uh, information aggregation and, and, and for decision making. At the moment, those systems, to the extent that they do exist, are still essentially dumb. In other words, they have to ask for instructions before doing anything. There will be a point at which we will get genuinely uh, intelligent uh, systems um, that are programmed uh, to work out what to do next uh, on the basis of what happened last. Um, and this brings me to my point, which is um, at, at the bottom of all of this is the algorithm, which conceptually is a very simple thing, but uh, in practice uh, very, very complicated. Um, and um, it seems to me that um, more and more there is going to be a case for us collectively uh, to understand how these algorithms work. Most of them at the moment are um, afforded uh, significant uh, intellectual property protection. This is particularly true in the, the, in the United States. So I have really two questions. One, uh, primarily, I think, to uh, Congressman Thornbury, you know, how do we manage that? How do we make sure that the algorithms that are being used in these contexts are the ones that we really, really do understand uh, without uh, violating um, these um, protections uh, that need to be uh, afforded. And secondly, to the panel um, more generally, um, if we do think we're heading towards a stage where we could end up with uh, genuinely uh, intelligent uh, uh, decision-making systems, um, do we need to sit around uh, the table and talk about uh, how to manage these uh, before we end up a, a, in a situation where um, the decision-making systems of two adversaries are, in effect, duking it out in cyberspace without uh, human intervention uh, with all sorts of potentially escalatory consequences. Nigel, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, James Brown from Australia. Uh, to my mind, the domain in which uh, the technology is becoming real much faster than we can have the conversation about its consequences is in the space domain. Um, each of your countries has increased investments both in defence and space technology recently, and I wonder if you could just speak a little on how you're thinking uh, about um, the, the, the consequences of space being increasingly uh, small, uh, cheap and private. Thank you very much. And the last one in this round, uh, Mr. Cohen, please. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll direct this to Congressman Thornbury and thank him for his uh, comments. But I've been uh, thinking about, as we've been talking, uh, how do we uh, accelerate the decision-making process to uh, match the increase in technology? But I guess the, the question I would have is, um, President Trump, during his campaign, said that he thought that NATO was obsolete. And uh, basically seeing um, democratic institutions uh, being somewhat uh, irrelevant to uh, current affairs, he since changed that. But it raised an issue uh, in my mind, for example, we see a trend toward uh, um, more authoritarian uh, governments uh, because they can make decisions quicker, faster. And I was wondering in terms of Congress itself, I uh, had the privilege of serving there for some 24 years. Uh, and I made a number of recommendations uh, at a time that the process is too slow. Uh, we have a budget process, which you start out with. Then we have an authorizing committee, which spends its time bringing all of our military and other uh, personnel to testify before the Congress. And then after we have an authorization committee, we have an appropriations committee. And then they have to reconcile their uh, judgments with that of the, the opposite uh, house. Uh, it takes a long time. And there's very little incentive for any of the members of Congress to give up their positions, to consolidate and have this a budget process or an appropriation process. And so it, it brings to my mind, as the government process is slower and slower with technology going faster and faster, I think the political, if you're talking about it culturally, the political pressure is going to be for more and more executive action more and more quick decisions, not coming through a democratic process, but coming from either a dictatorial, authoritarian uh, type of situation. So in addition to raising the issue of whether automation 
uh, whether we're going to have autonomous uh, decision making with uh, robotics uh, taking charge. The question is, is Congress democracies becoming obsolete in a world in which, uh, the nano world in which we're living? Thank you very much. Um, difficult questions uh, to, 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 uh, to answer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch up the order a little bit, uh, and I'd, I'd like to ask uh, David Koh to, to begin this round um, uh, with the particular issue that was put to you, um, but also any of the other ones that we'd like to share. Sure. Thank you. Just let me speak a little bit of the, uh, how the artificial intelligence helped to um, dig through the uh, mass of data that we have. Uh, basically, for the uh, Maritime Crisis uh, uh, Center, what we have is that we have, um, uh, our researchers have developed um, uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, back-end system, which ingests data from various uh, sources. Um, some of them include things like uh, uh, Lloyd's Register, white shipping, um, and uh, as well as uh, our own databases, uh, including, including classified data databases of individuals who have uh, on the travel uh, blacklist or intelligence uh, databases, and um, as well as social media feeds. So it's a whole mass of different types of data, uh, and we look for anomalous behavior. So one example of uh, the kinds of anomalous behavior that's, that uh, is flagged out is when you look at the um, travel patterns of uh, commercial ships then uh, typically they travel uh, in fixed uh, routes by and large. So if they depart from the fixed route and move off to a quiet part of the ocean, and then worse, if they marry up with another ship, uh, these are obviously uh, unusual behavior, which is not common uh, for commercial shipping. So this gets flagged out. It gets given a set of points uh, for subsequent uh, deliberation. Uh, and then uh, this all feeds into a decision um, support uh, uh, system when we look for different uh, um, uh, anomalies, different uh, um, uh, uh, data points, and then the points get flagged up, and beyond a certain number of points, it gets shot up to the analysts, and then the, the man in the loop would then take a look at it. And uh, so far, we've been uh, tweaking the system so that the thresholds are set at the um, the right level. And broadly speaking, this is what happens. And then we've successfully detected uh, a string of um, different. Uh, uh, anomalies which uh, contributed to the, the this particular case being flagged up and then when it was checked um, they, it was confirmed that he was a, a suspected uh, ISIL uh, sympathizer. There have been other cases which have been false positives where people have uh, similar names. I think it was very common in our region uh, and among the um, uh, ship's passengers or, or crewmen and then we have to then uh, uh, do a positive check on this. Just to speak a little bit about the challenge that this uh, looks at. We're looking at trying to integrate databases which are not aligned. They're for different purposes, different, uh, different data sets. Uh, some are classified, some are unclassified. Um, they come in different uh, formats. They have different uh, compatibility issues. And then when you look at um, uh, other challenges of language, you have to translate. And then, for, for example, social media. Social media is totally unstructured data. So there's a huge challenge uh, from a technical perspective of trying to align all this so that they can talk to one another and then process the databases and look for the anomalies. Uh, so, uh, but the final outcome is something that we are quite happy with. Uh, if I could uh, move on to one of the questions which was talking about uh, um, decision making and how do we look at algorithms so that we can understand them. I, I just want to speak uh, um, from a broader perspective, I think, uh, and uh, it's a point I think which echoes one of the comments which uh, the Air Chief Marshal said in his remarks. And that is that uh, as technology moves, it becomes more complex and it requires people with a technical uh, uh, background or engineering background to understand the complexity of it. However, these people are typically uh, more enamored with the technology itself uh, rather than uh, the policy issues. And then conversely, on the other side, the people who are dealing with the policy, whenever you start speaking uh, anything that's remotely technical, their eyes begin to glaze over. So there is a huge challenge between the two, and this gulf uh, does need to be uh, crossed, uh, either with the uh, technical folks learning to communicate uh, clearly, uh, which is a challenge in itself, uh, not uh, unique uh, to any particular language. I think the uh, whole culture of a lot of the technical people, I'm in charge of cyber, one of the big challenges that I have is that I, I you know, my, my, my experts can't speak English. Uh, and then the alternative, similarly, is for the policy people uh, to come and get their hands dirty and understand the technology because the technology is going to affect 
policy decision making at the high operational and the strategic level. And we can't make these kinds of decisions, policy uh, level decisions, unless we understand the technology and what it begins to mean to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congressman, if I could turn to you next um, and, and ask you whether, whether you agree with that proposition that, that democracies might have a structural disadvantage and that there's pressure on the kind of decision-making system uh, uh, that, that was described and, and, and uh, the balance between different branches of government might, might need to change. What are your thoughts on this? I subscribe to Churchill's view that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have ever been tried. Um, are there disadvantages to having a messy, convoluted debate among people who uh, may not know as much about the issue as they should? Of course there is. And does it slow us down? Yes. And. Uh, and we have to look for ways to improve that. And I think Secretary Cohen's point is exactly right. Uh, Congress, as, as challenging it is to reform the military, Congress is completely inadequate at reforming itself, um, despite uh, many of the recommendations uh, to, to, to bring our, but, but, but isn't that a prototypical case of where the demands of the time, and in many ways even the technology we use, uh, have advanced, and yet our organizations and processes have not kept up with those changes. Uh, now the result is delay and messiness when it comes to the United States Congress. Uh, the results are even more serious, I would suggest, when it comes to the battlefield. And, and so the necessity of that reform effort is, uh, is, is, is very strong. I'll take just a, another lesser example, but I do think it points the way forward. Over time, there have been abuses or mistakes made in the acquisition process, and so Congress's response have been to add new layers of requirements. Well, everybody's got to do that, and everybody's got to do this. At one point, there was a statutory requirement for a corrosion report on everything that the Pentagon bought, including software. <laughs> uh, so it just, it just shows you how these layers uh, come on top of one another. I think the future and what we're trying to do in this year's acquisition reform is to strip away those layers but use data analytics and, and, and other means to have transparency about what happened. So much more flexibility with uh, uh, among the managers of a program of an organization, but then the, the transparency for us in our constitutional oversight role to go back and look at what you did. Uh, in, it has to be in relevant time, but, but I do think that sort of accountability without the prescriptive rigidity that we've seen built up over time may, may point us in, in the right direction. Finally, um, I, I, I Despite its flaws, uh, I do think there are inherent advantages to a democracy where individuals can flourish and individuals can participate in making decisions that affect their lives that may be hard to quantify, but yet uh, are, are not only result in an enduring advantage for those societies, uh, but it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Colonel uh, Zhu, I, I wondered whether you um, uh, might uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts um, on that question that Nigel Ingstra has posed uh, around governance challenges uh, in, in, in uh, uh, AI um, and uh, maybe the need for uh, some sort of mechanism, dare I say, international regime to manage uh, some of these uh, challenges. Okay, uh, Nigel just uh, bring a very interesting question, uh, two very interesting questions. The first is how to manage such uh, uh, algorithm, algorithm. And I think uh, how, if we talk about how to manage such uh, algorithm, and uh, we had better to say how to uh, open it, or as an open, so open source. 
and to uh, cultivate uh, innovation, I think AI technology innovation. I, I noticed that in, in China, especially Alibaba and Baidu and uh, such IT company, uh, they are uh, open uh, a lot of, I think, a lot of algorithm um, to the public and to encourage people to use it and to make their AI products and to use in logistics and uh, e-commerce and such field. So there will be uh, challengeable questions about the, uh, uh, the, the copyright protection. But I think if we want to develop such technology and use the advantage of the AI technology uh, to make our life more happy, and perhaps it is a good example for us uh, to share, just like Alibaba and Baidu, what they have done. And the second question, it is very hard, I think, just like the uh, global internet governance, international governance of internet, we have uh, been the early stage of uh, the international governance of the uh, internet, I think. Because different countries have different uh, strategy or different, uh, uh, different uh, requirements. And if, uh, if we want to how control the AI system, just like you said, uh, we can correlate to the uh, cloud brain. It is a more efficient uh, decision-making system uh, supported by AI technology, and it is very hard. It is hard because, because we should, uh, each country should um, decide what is the appropriate shared cost, what is the appropriate shared responsibility, and what is the appropriate shared rights. To seek such a balance among the tough questions, it is very difficult. Perhaps there, you, America, and your, um, your huge alliance, and uh, many, many countries, uh, including the alliance, you can uh, design such AI decision-making system and as a model <laughs> to see if it can work very uh, efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Air Chief Marshall, no, no one has yet engaged with the space issue. I wonder whether um, you wanted to say something about that particular domain, um, but please feel free to pick up any of the other points as well. I think you're right that the, the cost of entry to space has come down dramatically and miniaturization in space is a reality. But that doesn't mean necessarily that all the potential applications are going to be of relevant military use. And I think the relevant military use is a, is a question. And I would put the challenge back on us and certainly the next generation of us to make sure they spend sufficient time asking carefully for what they want rather than technology telling people what they can do. Uh, because actually, if you define the requirements carefully, space can do all sorts of things, not least some of the boring things that people shouldn't be doing anymore. But it can also, if you leave it just to the technologists, you get the solution they want rather than the solution you need. And that applies to something else I'd like to say. I know time is tight, so I'll be very quick, perhaps a bit too brutally quick. And the, the point for Nigel, is there is a human intervention needed in the AI process. Mm. The trick is knowing not just where to put the intervention, but then to educate the right people to have sufficient technical awareness, not necessarily be technologists, sufficient technology awareness to know when to intervene. And that applies now to operations. So then linking to the former congressman's point, I think the comment about the NATO alliance, if I take the NATO alliance as a military alliance and leave the politics to others, NATO's great strength 
has been to provide standardization through command and control. And in answer to many of these questions, the answer is if you keep the command and control solution simple, you can still continue to peer, try and see through the fog of war. And the last thing I say, just as a challenge in the spirit of the Institute, is of course authoritarian, authoritarian governments may make quick decisions, but they may not necessarily make good decisions. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, nine minutes left, and I've got six people who still uh, are seeking the floor. So um, can I ask if you had three questions, dial it down to one, um, uh, and, and try and limit yourselves to uh, a rapid-fire intervention so that I can give the panel uh, a chance uh, for their concluding remarks uh, 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 quickly. Uh, Mr. Liu from China, please. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. Uh, the implication of the emerging technology will, you know, we will benefit from that, but it also could bring us with some negative consequences. So I want to take example of the WannaCry. It originally we are, you know, eternal blue from the NSA. It's the, actually the, you know, cyber weapon leaked by NSA. So I want to talk this question from the governance perspective specifically to the congressman. What do you think of the, the from the legislative you know, perspective, how you governance this kind of issues? And also for other you know, panelists, how we start our international arm control in terms of you know, cope with this kind of the per proliferation of the cyber weapons? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben Barry. Thanks, Bastian. We should be under no illusions. Militaries often find this very difficult. And for example, the UK and US record is almost as much a failure as success, whether it's been in the difficult Iraq or Afghan wars, or indeed throughout the last century. Now, for those of you who are more interested in this, there's a chapter in, on learning and under fire in the Institute's latest Adelphi on the hard lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan, which I had the privilege to write. I've continued to research this, and I'd be happy to share my work with those who are interested, but I think culture and people is at the heart of difficulty and success. And in militaries, there's ingrained tension between hierarchies, obedience to orders, and peacetime bureaucracy, and the sort of person you need in operations who I describe as a combat entrepreneur. And this is why leadership is so important, both joining up the top-down and bottom-up adaptation and innovation, and also commanders and senior leaders leading and encouraging innovation and adaptation. This can be very difficult, and you only have to contrast, say, Donald Rumsfeld with Robert Gates. And I think getting that right is probably the single most important factor that can lead to militaries innovating and adapting successfully. Ben, thank you very much, and, and good plug for the, for the book. Uh, I encourage everybody to read it. Um, uh, Mr. Tan, please. I'm Tan uh, from Vietnam. Uh, I'm uh, support your comment today. Uh, because uh, defense uh, uh, implication uh, new technology for keep peace in the world. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, what are you doing uh, about problem control IS uh, if uh, you use uh, uh, new technology often in the future? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Simon, uh, Charlie, you, you had your uh, board up earlier, so are you still? Yeah. Uh, no, it was on procurement and it's been answered. Adequately by CDS. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, Jonathan. Thanks, Bastian. Uh, one of the panelists, I think it might have been Congressman Thornberry, um, mentioned that, um, and been in passing, that there had been some resistance, um, military cultural resistance, for example, to unmanned air vehicles. Um, and I just wondered, it reminded me of an episode that occurred um, fairly recently at the Pentagon where I think. Secretary Panetta instituted a medal for, for drone operators that ranked, I believe, slightly higher than a Bronze Star with a V, which met vehement 
and su ultimately successful resistance from serving military who basically got the medal removed or well, basically got it downgraded um, to something quite a bit below the level of a bronze star with a V because, you know, the theory being or the, the emotion being that, um, you know, for their to, risk of life and, or valor, for lack of a better term, was necessary to merit that kind of medal. Um, I wondered if, if anybody saw any substantial or significant military, cultural, or psychological constraints on the institution or application of new technologies. Obviously, in the case of the drone situation, um, the utility of the drones are simply, is simply so high that, that they, they, they exceed any of those particular um, concerns. Awesome. Thank you very much. Alex, you had your board up as well. Are you still interested? Uh, very, very briefly, um, to Colonel Daw, um, we all know that uh, at the beginning of the 1990s, President Jiang Zemin announced that the PLA had to begin the path towards winning wars, local wars, under informationized, uh, an informationized environment. Now, I know that doctrinally, that has been the driving um, almost a systemic uh, doctrine over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, now the PLA is under considerable military reform. Uh, could, you, could you give an indication of how that doctrine that was started by Jiang Zemin is going to change uh, after the 19th Party Congress? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, three and a half minutes left, and we need to bring this uh, to a close, uh, pretty much uh, bang on time, because people have other meetings to get to. So I'll invite uh, concluding comments from the panel, and, and I'll invite you to be ruthless in what you would like to engage with. And uh, Air Chief Marshal, I'll invite you first, please. Uh, I thank you for the question from our colleague from Vietnam. I think it is interesting. You take everyday ob objects and use it to turn them into weapons then you need to think about how to respond to that. We can't have a control regime for everyday objects, but I was very struck by our colleague and minister from Singapore's view of using AI to look for the needle in the haystack. And I think that's the real answer to your question, to be brutally quick. And in answer to the many other questions, I keep coming back to the thought that, Ben, of course you're right. Mr. Stevenson, of course you're right. We need to find rewarded recognition strategies for the people we need now, not keep trying to find the way of applying the old strategies of reward and recognition in the new environment. Uh, I'm being brutally quick, but at the moment, we're not there, and we need to do something different. Thank you very much. Uh, David Cole. Uh, let me speak a little bit about cultural uh, uh, resistance to technology and change. Uh, Singapore's a small country. Actually, uh, um, we, we know most of uh, our the senior leadership, but despite this, uh, the challenge of uh, interdepartmental rivalry and turf issues is scalable. We have them in Singapore as well. And uh, I would say that even for drones, the challenge of introducing drones in our Air Force. In our, our Air Force, we, we, and everything that flies comes under our Air Force. Uh, so we don't have an Army Air Corps or um, uh, planes in our um, the uh, Navy. Um, when we tried to introduce the drones in our Air Force, there was a huge resistance by the uh, senior leadership in the Air Force. Um, and um, the Permanent Secretary had no choice, but he built, he started to build the capability outside the Air Force. So it was built in the Joint Staff uh, as, a, as a start to bypass the cultural resistance of the fighter pilots who were running the Air Force. Uh, it was only when a more enlightened uh, Chief of Air Force took over that he uh, took back the entire uh, setup that had been built in the Joint Staff. And um, today we'll see the uh, challenges of um, cyber. We're trying to build the uh, defense uh, cyber organization. As I said, the, we have a conscript uh, system and we are trying to build um, and, and arguably, one can say that in Singapore, I have the pick of all 18-year-olds uh, from the entire school system. Uh, and ideally, I should be able to choose uh, the best people who are most uh, um, aligned, uh, both the best in terms of aptitude. But the cultural challenges uh, of the, uh, the army, for example, is that anyone who is combat fit should be a rifleman. 
and do the the warrior thing, and uh, we we raised the question that if he is a if he's the next Steve Jobs, should he spend his two years of conscript life as a rifleman, or should we better employ him in cyber? And the answer said, if he's combat fit, he should be a rifleman in the foxhole, and that's the way it should be. So we are trying to overcome challenges like this. I think these are non-trivial. Uh, the military, as people have pointed out, is a hierarchical. There are strong cultures. Uh, there are good reasons for this, but these are the challenges that we have to face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. On cyber arms control, arms control works if it is to both or all parties' mutual benefit and if there is verification. Uh, it does not work where there are names on a paper which uh, one or more parties proceeds to, to go and violate when they think it is in their interest to do so. Uh, clandestinely or, or, or publicly. Can you meet uh, the tests of mutual benefit and verification when it comes to cyber? Well, maybe, but I'm not quite convinced of it yet. Um, I, I, just to foot stomp the, the point, uh, I think our Pentagon did not do uh, probably a good job of thinking through how this particular metal fits into other metals and, for, and what it rewards people for. On the other hand, back to a point the chair made earlier, if we are to attract and keep the kind of uh, top quality people in all fields, we have to find a way not only to have some sort of decent pay and benefits, but other kinds of rewards and recognitions for that sort of, of service. So I don't know exactly what the metal will have on, should have on it, but if that's a factor, and I think it may well be, we have, we have to develop it. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Zhu. Um, if I could ask you to, in particular, respond to the question yes. uh, from Alex Neal. Yes. Okay. I first of all, I want to uh, respond to Neil's question, and your question is a general question. And since 1990s, uh, from the uh, from the uh, from Jiang Zemin era, and the PLA has uh, uh, started the modernization especially uh, with the support of uh, technology. And we're still on the road, still on the way. And, and we, uh, we can see that PRA have, have, are, have, achieved, have achieved much uh, progress uh, to the purpose or the aim of strategic purpose of modernization but we still have a lot of questions, a lot of problems. And this round of reform, uh, reform just like uh, Dr. Chipman said, the reform is comprehensive and will uh, give the PRA profound influence. And, and how to achieve the PRA's purpose of modernization, and we have uh, outlook of the uh, to use technology as the equipment and our uh, our idea our brain and we look uh, when we look uh, look on the technology development the development is changed very fast like a gentleman said uh, change very fast and the progress we have made uh, it's not at the pace as the technology development. So it, that's the situation. So we're still on the way. Okay. Perhaps um, in the 19th, uh, the party's 19th uh, party uh, meeting, uh, we're still on the way. With and I want to uh, summarize my my uh, um, my understanding. The firstly, yes, very briefly. Uh, firstly, uh, with the development of ICT and the proliferation and the dissemination of such technology, we should stick to the common, shared, comprehensive, and consistent security uh, to cope with uh, the drastic changing uh, challenges. But secondly, I don't think technology can resolve all the problems. We should uh, focus on uh, more on the culture, the people, 
and uh, only people can share, can shoulder uh, the right responsibility, can shoulder, uh, only people can understand, can uh, resolve the difference between uh, different cultures. And if we can improve uh, more and more uh, understandings between each other, and we can reach a uh, mutual confidence, perhaps it will be easier uh, than before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we only had 90 minutes uh, to deal with, with uh, what is a, a very complex and, and wide-ranging field. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, uh, good thoughts and interesting ideas were put on the table that will inform uh, defense diplomacy. They will certainly also inform uh, the research efforts uh, uh, of the IISS and I imagine of many others. Um, before we thank our speakers for their, for their excellent contributions, just uh, one final housekeeping note. Those who are attending the Istana dinner uh, tonight, please assemble in the island ballroom foyer by 1900, otherwise you will miss the bus. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, and everybody, thank everybody for, for their contributions, but please uh, give a round of applause to our speakers for their excellent speeches. <laughs>